Hi, I'm Emily Maxwell, and I am the Artistic Director and Founder of the Disability Collective. I'm Nathan Sartore, and I'm the Managing Director here at the Disability Collective. And I'm Ali Hand, the Director of Accessibility and Community Outreach here at the Disability Collective. The Disability Collective is a not-for-profit organization and community of disabled artists dedicated to celebrating and showcasing disability in the arts. TDC strives to destigmatize disability and challenge perceptions of what disability looks like through promoting disabled artists in a variety of forms, including live performances, virtual showcases, visual art shows, readings, and more. We believe that disability can be defined in many ways, including physical impairments, mental health conditions, emotional disabilities, sensory disabilities, cognitive challenges, neurodiversity, and chronic illnesses. We also believe that disability provides a unique perspective that deserves to be shared. One billion people, or 15% of the world's population, experience some form of disability. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to disproportionately affect the disabled community. Disabled folks are at a higher risk of contracting COVID-19 due to their disabilities or underlying health conditions which can compromise their immune systems. Nobody Left Behind is an online campaign centered around the concerns of the disabled community regarding the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions, including mask and vaccine mandates. We hope that this campaign will raise awareness around those who are being left behind as the rest of the world returns to normal. We hope that you enjoy the following videos showcasing the work of 10 incredible disabled artists who, along with the TDC team, share their stories about how the COVID-19 pandemic and the lifting of restrictions has affected them. Not Waiting by Martha Bonney. I used to hope to be hopeful, to have hope, but hope bled out of me into endless vials of blood draws. Hope seeped from my cells and bones and muscles, leaving me weary. My hopefulness kept my limbs from moving, my arms from stretching, and my lips from curling into a smile. Hope kept my words smothered inside like a fire unable to ignite. I am not hopeless, yet I do not have hope. Hope turned inside out and became stained with crimson fear. Fear leaves me immobile and tortured inside my own fragile ecosystem. The fear of losing what has already been lost. Fear is tossing pebbles into the air and watching them sink like concrete blocks to the bottom of the lake. Fear pushes me away further and further until I might never return. The dread of not knowing what will happen when I move my lips to speak is terrifying. My voice calls out into the darkness, but it doesn't carry. It is too hoarse, too tiny, too jumbled, too not enough. Fear can't be rearranged back into hope. Worry, despair, and loneliness replace the fading H, the hollow O, the dropped P, and the erased E. But why am I waiting? What am I waiting for? The answers come screaming, shouting, pounding into my misfiring synapses, into my aching joints, my wasted muscles. Finally, I tune to listen to the only answer I will ever need. Discord tries to cover the weighted reply. Endless questions about recovery, treatment, and care plans noisily ricocheting from floor to ceiling. Blank to-do lists, empty calendars, hiss like a taunted rattlesnake on a warm spring desert trail. It's not enough. It never will be. Yet I hear the answer. It is deafening, concise, strong, persistent, determined for only my ears. It is simple and luminous. I am not waiting. I am neither hopeful nor hopeless, neither fearful nor fearless. I am here, devoid of hope, drained of fear, not waiting.
I am not waiting, because this moment is already upon me and will pass if I wait or hope or fear. No medications or experts will define what I already have. The right now shines golden light onto my path to possibility, potential, to purpose. I know that millions of people around the world lost their loved ones or were affected by terrible illness during the COVID pandemic. And I would never ever wish that to happen to anyone, anyone again or in any kind of way. As a person with a disability though, there are aspects of the lockdown that were comforting and made my life a lot easier and a lot less painful. The world was quieter. I could hear. I could hear one person talking to me. I didn't have to travel. I wasn't forced to be in loud, overwhelming environments. Now that the restrictions have been lifted, the world is so chaotic. The noise drowns out most every thought I have all day long. I'm challenged to try to communicate beyond the safety of the small circle of my family, my husband and my kids. I have to travel in cars, planes, other travel instead of what I truly love, which is just hiking on trails. Being in stores again, full of unmasked, unvaccinated, unrestricted shoppers. It's overwhelming. Well, I remain isolated. I miss the quiet, the comfort, the peace, the safety of the lockdown. But for my children and the rest of the world, I know that I have to learn to adapt to life. It is a daily challenge. My only option is to continue to face the challenge and to keep going. And I'll always keep trying. No Body Left Behind by Emily Taroni. Hi, my name is Emily Taroni, and I am a disabled collage artist living in Cambridge, New York. My work celebrates people with disabilities, often using surrealism and humor. I want to challenge societal perceptions and stigmas about the disability community. I created the piece Community Dies to express the impact the pandemic and society's response to it is having on the most vulnerable in our communities, including people with disabilities and chronic illnesses. The pandemic has been a scary and lonely time, specifically for the vulnerable, and it's been distressing to see a lack of empathy and priority to protect the vulnerable in society. I feel that every member of a community has the responsibility to do what they can to protect everyone in the community, especially the vulnerable. We all benefit from community and we all should do what we can to help each other. I have a congenital myopathy that causes fatigue and muscle weakness. Because of my muscle weakness, I have poor lung function, which is why I'm high risk for COVID-19. I have stayed isolated for most of the pandemic and practice strict precautions when I do go out in public. At the end of fall 2021, 
I went back into more strict isolation because of COVID spikes. I was hoping to be able to go out in public and visit family and friends more. But as restrictions lift and people take less precautions, it is difficult for me to feel safe. The vaccination rate is low in my area and there are no masking or social distancing measures. People are not reporting positive tests and contact tracing is not happening as much and it appears it will stop as COVID funding runs out. I worry that health insurance companies will stop providing COVID tests and I will be unable to spend time with close family and friends. Before the pandemic, I worked as a customer service evaluator and because precautions are lifting, I am unable to return to taking these jobs that have helped me earn money and interact with the community. I created the piece Nobody Left Behind in support of this campaign. I believe it's important to remember everyone when moving forward and that the pandemic is not over and we still need to take precautions and do what we can. This piece is made using magazine images and letters and mulberry paper on a canvas panel. The piece is meant to represent people with disabilities and our right to be included and protected in society. Hi everyone, Nathan here, Managing Director of the Disability Collective. I am a young white man with short brown hair and blue eyes. Today I'm wearing a light blue long sleeve denim shirt and I'm sitting in my living room. On my left is a gray couch with a couple of pillows. Behind me is a cream colored wall as well as some exposed brick. On the wall I have a painting of my cats. And to my right is my fiddly fig. So I am immunocompromised due to the medication that I take for my disability, which means that I really had to take every single precaution to keep myself and my loved ones safe, whether that be wearing a mask, getting vaccinated, really anything that I could. But really what that meant is completely isolating myself. So I've been in this wonderful living room for essentially two years now. And although it is nice in here, you know, I wasn't able to really go out and, and do anything at all because I didn't want to put myself at risk. And that makes me feel guilty in a sense because in a way it's forcing the people who, who are around me, my family and my friends, to take the same precautions, which does leave me with a feeling of guilt. And this continues to this day, just because some folks think that the pandemic is over, it's really not. And so I'm still having to take these precautions for myself. I was grateful to have a lot of opportunities to stay home and work from home and, and be creative from home, but that wasn't always the case. I did miss out on opportunities that were in person on top of not seeing my family, not seeing my friends, not being able to go to a restaurant, which a lot of people are taking for granted right now. Little things that, you know, don't seem like a lot, but when you're staying at home all the time, it can be really difficult. And so it has been difficult. It has been isolating emotionally. It's certainly taken a toll to, you know, not be able to go outside. I am still wearing my mask. I've had all the vaccines I can get. I will be running to get my fourth dose as soon as possible. But those things really go a long way in keeping someone like me and all of your fellow disabled, chronically ill, immunocompromised neighbors safe. And not just the disabled community, it's everyone. This is so important for us as a society to move forward from this pandemic because I know some people have decided that they're tired of this and listen I am too I wish I didn't have to wear a mask I wish I didn't have to stay at home but that's the reality because if I were to get sick it could be really really dangerous and I don't want to end up in the hospital the ICU I don't even want to think about the worst case scenario which is really scary wearing a mask getting vaccinated is so important because the pandemic is far from over. And I think we all want to get back to normal as we've seen some people already have gotten back to normal. Yay, lucky you. But we all deserve to be able to get back to normal. And I don't know why the disabled community is being left behind. We should not be leaving anyone behind or sacrificing some folks just so that you can go to a restaurant, uh, go see a show, win an election. It's really not worth it. So as we consider Getting back to normal, I think what is safer to think about is how we can collectively get back to a new normal. And we're not there yet. It's going to take time and it's going to mean that we need to continue to keep each other safe, to take precautions, wearing your mask, getting vaccinated if you haven't yet. I urge you and encourage you if you haven't to do so. And together, 
we will get through this, but it's not fair to move forward when we all can't do it together. Thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the rest of these videos by these incredible artists. Cocoon by Lisa Shen. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Shen and I'm a writer and spoken word artist based in the Toronto area. For the past seven years, I've been living with this neurological disease slash chronic pain disorder that results in me having pain in all my extremities, as well as widespread muscle tension. And this means that I struggle a lot with things like walking and standing. And over time, what happened is that this resulted in me feeling really socially isolated. Because if you don't think about it, um, most outings require some amount of standing, whether you're going to a concert um, or even just commuting downtown. And so a lot of social events I couldn't participate in. So on my end, when COVID-19 happened, um, suddenly not, uh, not only was I no longer the only person who was feeling isolated, but all of these social opportunities moved online. So things like comedy shows or even gaming nights with friends. And this really helped remove the barriers to my participation. So I wrote this essay, Cocoon, that I'm about to share a bit of in early 2021, after about a year of the pandemic. And it talks about this newfound belonging of mine in an online world and how strange it was for me to be finding joy where others were experiencing loss. And for me, now that these COVID-19 like restrictions are beginning to be lifted, I feel the opposite of that. Like I'm going to be experiencing loss where others are rediscovering joy and embracing myself for the sadness that I know I'm going to feel when everyone else can return outdoors and I am somewhat left behind. So I'm now going to read a portion of my essay, Cocoon. In the spring of 2020, a butterfly flapped its wings on the other side of the world, and Ontario cocooned itself into a state of lockdown. Maintain physical distancing, blinked the highway signs. Save a life. So we went home, locked our doors, and opened up the blue-white screens of our laptops. At the click of a mouse, everything moved online. Musicals, gaming nights, comedy shows. My concerns of injury evaporated with the last of winter's snow. In their place, the glow of my computer screen, a window into everything I had been missing. And the world opened up to me. Tonight, I am in both Toronto and Vancouver, California and New York. Without the need for a body, I can go anywhere. Here, in the safety of my room, there is no sitting on the edges of a banquet hall while dozens of brightly colored dresses chatter and mill about. There is no staying behind while the rest of the lab embarks on a hike down to Coots. I am in the center of the crowd at the Pride Parade. I am the first one on the dance floor at prom. With the locking down of our country, the borders of social life have been opened up to me. For the first time in a long time, I am just as alone as everyone else. I do not know how long the sense of belonging will last, whether it will be gone in the span of months or if it will trickle out into the years to come, leaving little golden rivers for me to follow after the rest of the world has gone back outdoors. However, while it remains, the only thing left to do is ask, may I have this dance? Thank you so much to everyone for listening to my experience and my work. If you want to keep up with my ongoing work, I'm It's Lisa Shen on Instagram. And please make sure to check out the rest of the No Body Left Behind campaign as we advocate for the rights of people with disabilities in the wake of COVID-19. Thank you so much. Flames by Gwen Howard I think you think You know just what to say Thank you.
consequential to my life. When the ashes settle, you'll see time is on my side. You can tell me that it's our sin. Baby, I would see it's friendly fire. in the UK, which is adopting a living with COVID model. There are no mitigation measures anymore. This essentially means that the UK government and society have weighed the outcomes. The sacrifices needed to protect disabled people are not worth it. Disabled people should have to make sacrifices to protect themselves. This is their natural burden. As a musician, living with COVID has meant that I have watched from the sidelines as my peers and colleagues return to music venues, rehearsals, and collaborations. I mourn the lack of online residencies, performance opportunities, and social connections that, for a short period, revolutionized accessibility in the music and arts communities. I wonder if folks make the connection that their actions are, in part, what is keeping disabled people they know and love from being able to enjoy the liberties that they have, I wrote Flames to address this feeling. I wished my life could be disentangled from those who don't, quote unquote, get it, but who still hold power over my life through their actions or positions of authority. It's a little fiery song of rebellion. Hey, I'm CM. I'm part of the Disability Collective, and I don't like having my face online, mostly for like my own safety and for my own mental health. COVID started at the end of 2019, but like I very much felt it like the end of January 2020, I was not in Canada at the time. I was in New York. It was announced that like COVID was globally a concern when I got back to Canada after you land on a plane and all that stuff. They do like um, customs and all of that kind of interview. My sibling and I that I was on the trip with like very much noticed who was being questioned longer. We both look visibly Asian. People just like assume that like, oh, you must be Chinese as well. And you must be coming from China. And that's where the virus is from. So you must have it. That really set the tone for like me and like my family and my friends who like definitely saw the shift in like how we were being treated. You're on TTC and somebody would move out of their seat and go further. They're like not as close to you. And it was just the beginning. It was before the lockdowns even happened. Yes, I'm proud to be Asian, but like there's so many different cultures, different languages, 
different ethnicities. We're not all the same person. We move differently. We experience the world differently. Because I'm a person with a chronic cough, I'm most likely going to be coughing. The thing that like really was like illuminating, I was in Toronto and I was picking up prescriptions and I was coughing and a security guard would follow me. And I understand that like people might feel unsafe because they heard the cough. I understand that because like I have like that's in the back of my mind, too, when I hear somebody cough. Uh, like, I'm there to pick up prescriptions. I'm there to p- pick up medicine that I need so the cough that I have isn't as persistent, isn't as loud, isn't as painful to me. And it happened more than once. My anxiety definitely got worse over time. Even more so when, like, restrictions were slowly being lifted because the pandemic wasn't over. It still isn't over. And every time people, like, rejoiced and like took their masks off or didn't think that they needed to be vaccinated or were just partying with large groups of people i'm just like you're making it worse for everybody who doesn't have the choice to just be in community with people in person i still haven't felt safe enough to like actually go out the rest of my family has and some of them have had covid now i have not seen a single doctor of mine this entire time because of all like the different ways it's like every time one of the specialists would say yeah we'll wait until like COVID is a little bit more calm and pushed back when we might be able to see each other in person and it keeps getting pushed back I definitely feel like a lot of people was like oh it's just gonna be old people it's just gonna be people who are already really sick that are gonna get COVID it's almost the attitude of like they're gonna die soon anyway so is it really gonna be that big of a deal I know people that have died because of COVID and just because it doesn't affect you as an individual doesn't mean that it isn't affecting your community at large that it isn't affecting the world inequity is real and it's very apparent during a global pandemic. If people really want this pandemic to be over, first think about the people that it's going to take the longest to get through this. The people that need more support and more resources, better policies from the government. Disabled people are at more risk and we need to prioritize like disabled lives and their well-being because everybody else might be able to move on and say that the pandemic is over, but it's probably going to stay around. And it will always be harder on disabled people. It will be harder on immunocompromised people because they are at more risk of getting COVID. They're at more risk of getting more sick. They're at more risk of dying. Politicians who have the money and the resources to get better, who not die from COVID, are the ones deciding for everybody, for disabled people, that the cost of their lives is worth it. Not the same boat by Sue Dixon. I knew I could adapt to COVID. I spent a decade stuck at home because I was too sick to leave. So staying at home while in better health would be a walk in the park compared to when I did time just staring at the walls. For most of COVID, I flourished. Virtual programs saw me included in my community in ways I could not do when my illness or disabilities limited me. I tried new things, and made new friends while others, others were complaining about not being able to go bowling. But I'm not flourishing anymore. A strategy of pervasive infection as a way to manage COVID has crippled my potential. Spring was supposed to bring me relief from the measures of isolation I needed in order to protect myself from Omicron. But now, community programs are all in-person events. I am excluded because my body does not have the fortitude to learn to live with it. We were all in this together when platitudes benefited everyone. Now that thoughtfulness is no longer required for everyone to stay well, we see that being in this together was a choice that those with health privilege no longer have to abide. Our group speak was disingenuous. The precarious were only incidentally included during the last two years. I'm disappointed that people care so little about their neighbors. I am disgusted that so many people have been designated as disposable. People have merit beyond enriching landlords and making widgets. We are neither crop nor livestock, only useful for feeding those who want to farm resources. We deserve to be held in the same regard as everyone else. 
we are worthy of dignity and deserve to be able to select our own produce without risking our health. We are in the same storm, but not the same boat. Normal is a Construct by Megan Bent Quarantine Day 7 A brown, round hydrangea leaf on a black background. Printed in the light umber chlorophyll is a self-portrait where half my face is lit by the sun and my head and eyes are tilted upward. Hi, Megan Bent here. At the very beginning of the pandemic, I felt like a canary in the coal mine. Understanding that health is not a given and that you can do everything right and still become ill, I started taking precautions early on. I had acquaintances tell me not to worry, only the sick and elderly will die, but I am chronically ill and immunocompromised. In this dissonance, I realized that while we are all affected by COVID-19 in some way, we're not all living the same pandemic experience. Quarantine Day 121 A teardrop-shaped hosta leaf on a black background. Printed in the chlorophyll is a self-portrait while wearing a face mask. My face takes up the whole leaf and only one eye is visible through overgrown sweeping hair. The face mask is decorated with a vine and leaf pattern. My most recent series, I Don't Want to Paint a Silver Lining Around It, is my personal reflection of being high risk in the pandemic. Through staring back and creating authentic representation, I am empowering myself. Pandemic Eugenics 2 A bright orange maple leaf on a black background with the phrase, Sacrifice the weak, embossed into it. A quote from the April 2020 Reopen the Country protests in the U.S. I am also critiquing the outside world's demand that disabled people be acceptable losses for personal convenience or for corporate profit. I create meaning not just through imagery, but also through the process. With the chlorophyll process, I print images directly onto leaves through photosynthesis. By connecting disability and nature, I claim disability as a valuable part of human diversity. In Crip Time A vertical hosta leaf on a black background. Printed in the chlorophyll is a hand holding a necklace with a spoon pendant up to the sun. In the middle is a black text box with white text in crypt time. Chlorophyll prints are created through a cooperative relationship with organic materials and the environment. It is a process that celebrates care, interdependence, slowness, and flexibility. Values I find in the disability community. The fact that chlorophyll prints are impermanent and will continue to decay over time underscores the interdependence and bodily impermanence we all share. Quarantine Day 280 A green oval-shaped hosta leaf on a black background. The leaf is going diagonally across the frame with the leaf stem in the top left. Printed into the chlorophyll is a self-portrait where my eyes and face mask are visible. The rest of my face and hair gradually disappear into the leaf. It is really strange for me in this moment to watch a majority eager to return to normal, 
and I'm really disappointed, but not surprised, at the CDC's ableist decision to get rid of masks again. The construction of the word concept normal occurred in the 1800s after Adolphe Quetlet used the astronomer's law of errors to map stars. All sightings of a star were plotted and then averaged to determine its place on the map. Quetlet applied it to human characteristics, creating the first bell curves in what he called the average man. which became known as normal and creating its binary abnormal. He called this movement social physics and it was the precursor and in inspiration for eugenics. So when society disregards universal protections, especially for vulnerable communities, so that they can get back to normal, what are they really advocating for? I don't want to go back to normal. Normal is a construct that never worked. I want to be where there is space and care for all body minds. Hi everyone, it's Ali, a TDC team member here. I am a white woman with blue eyes and blonde hair that's tied back. I'm wearing a white t-shirt with a blue button-up over top, and I'm in front of a dark green background. Um, I just wanted to come on here quickly this evening to chat about my experience with the pandemic and now with the lifting of the mandates. Now, I want to quickly mention I am, of course, a disabled artist. However, my disability does not put me at a higher risk with COVID-19 of contracting or having long-term effects from the virus. Um, so I really want to keep this brief as I don't feel like tonight is about me <laughs> at all. Um, however, I did want to shed a little bit of light quickly on my experience as an artist uh, throughout this pandemic. So I was working a job, a performing job back at Christmas time, and the company was not doing enough to protect the performers from the virus. We weren't being tested. Um, vaccines weren't being checked and we all got COVID and we all lost our jobs. And there was really no financial support for us at that time, unfortunately. And now that mandates are being lifted, artists are really being forced to choose between their health or potentially the health of those surrounding them, loved ones who are potentially immune compromised um, and working. Even to the point that if you get an audition and the audition panel isn't enforcing masks, you don't even have that job yet. You're not getting paid for that, but you are choosing between potentially working and putting your health at risk um, when it would just be so easy to keep a mask on, to keep checking vaccines, to keep these systems that we already have in place working because they do work. So that's my little piece of information, my little perspective. Thank you so much. Carnival by Lee Jera Edmonds Allen Jumping on the trampoline. Giddy. Sugared. Sticky. Shrieking. Flattened lawn. Under their feet. Rushing to the birthday party. Underneath. The cracked concrete. Live my friends. And flesh. And me. Gasping. Wheezing. With each beat. Of running. Jumping. Abled feet. How blessed am I to give my flesh for you to jump on, give you rest, bone frame make your happy world where we are just unwelcome guests. Hello, my name is Lugera Edmonds Allen. I wrote this poem after my university lifted the mask mandate on campus and then had a university wide carnival event. Uh, I couldn't help but think about how. The disabled, immunocompromised, and immunosuppressed bodies on campus were being put at risk. It felt like I was in some sort of horror movie where only I could see the killer. 
and walking around all these like bright, colorful advertisements and carnival games, it was just so terrifying. Black Disabled Lives Matter by Jermaine Greaves. I refuse to be boxed in. I want to be boxed out. I don't want to live to, to think that because I'm in a wheelchair, I can't do this thing or I can't organize an action. Everything I did was, everything I've ever did as a disabled person was because they told me I couldn't do it. And I want to keep breaking ground and, and taking names and making space in any space I can because that's my responsibility. It is my responsibility to do this work. People with disabilities need to know that they have a person that's fighting for them, going to Albany, going to Congress. The work must be done and I intend to do that work. And I want to do that work. And I'm excited to do this work and embark on this journey. Hi, my name is Jermaine Grieve. How has the COVID pandemic affected me? Well, I caught COVID in January. Also, while having a running infection and a condition called hydrogenitis. It was a lot for me being in the hospital from basically January to April. And I believe that everybody should keep wearing their masks to protect themselves and to remind themselves of you know the simple fact that a pandemic is still raging although restrictions are being lifted we must protect one another regardless of whether you, of whether you feel wearing a mask is not for you there are immunocompromising people there are people who get sick there are people who have different conditions and you know and there's different ways to get infections so Protect the disabled and immunocompromising people in your life. And um, it's important and it's necessary. And it's important that we protect one another during this pandemic time. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily, and I'm the founder and artistic director of the Disability Collective. I am a white woman with red hair and blue eyes. I'm wearing a black and white striped t-shirt, and I'm sitting on a turquoise chair in front of my white fireplace, which has a couple of plants and a couple of photos in frames on top of it. The past couple of years during the COVID-19 pandemic have been incredibly difficult for me and for my partner, who is also disabled and immunocompromised. My personal disability has progressed incredibly rapidly over the last two years because I haven't been able to see the doctors and specialists that I'm supposed to be seeing regularly to get the care and the treatment that I need. And this has now left me with permanent aspects of my disability that I didn't have before the pandemic. And it's been a very difficult couple of years of adjusting and learning what this version of my life means for me. I have always been disabled since the day I was born and have always identified as such, but the last couple of years have really emphasized my disability because I was not able to access the healthcare that I needed because I couldn't go anywhere. I basically haven't been able to really leave my house in two years. I haven't gone anywhere, not even to the grocery store. This is because it would be extremely risky for me to do so. I am at a higher risk of getting COVID and I'm also at a higher risk of getting seriously sick if I were to get COVID. I've had to turn down work and multiple job opportunities because I did not feel that it was safe for me to return to work yet. This has put a lot of financial strain 
on me and my partner. Towards the beginning of this year, 2022, I lost a member of my family, a very beloved member of my family who I was very close with. And I wasn't able to spend as much time with her leading up to her passing as I would have liked to because it wasn't safe for me to do so. And that's been really hard knowing that if people had maybe taken these precautions more seriously, I would have had more time. I don't even know how to really wrap my head around that. It feels quite clear to me that majority of the world don't care about disabled people. And I know that maybe seems like a harsh statement, but given the way things are going, as someone who is disabled, who is living this experience, I can tell you firsthand that we are not being considered when it comes to the lifting of mandates and what is currently happening in the world with COVID-19. I've heard so many people say, now that the pandemic's over, that's one of the hardest things to hear because it's not over for so many of us. You know, a quarter of the world's population have some sort of disability. Are you really willing to sacrifice one quarter of the world's population so that you can go to a restaurant or to a party or on vacation? Because I'm not. And I just thought that our communities and people would care about each other enough to protect each other. I also get extremely frustrated when politicians are using this pandemic for political gain when they are not the ones who are being most impacted by the pandemic. You are making decisions that could have life or death impact on, on me, on my fiance, on a bunch of our friends. The mask mandate was lifted too soon. It should still be in effect. To me, that's not even just an opinion, it's a fact. You can look at the numbers, you can look at the data. It was lifted too soon. In a lot of places, especially here in Ontario, where we have an election coming up, it was lifted as a political move. It wasn't based on any science. It was against the advisement of a lot of doctors and scientists. And it's really disappointing to know that the politicians, the ones who are making all of the rules and regulations, the ones who are supposed to be looking after us, really don't care. And they're happy for us to be left behind if it means that they get to go back to their version of normal. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the videos you'll see tonight. Pandemic Perspective by Christina Baltice. Hi, my name's Christina Baltice, and I'm an artist from Toronto, Ontario. I live with a disease known as myalgic encephalomyelitis. And my personal experiences directly influence the art I create. I'm particularly interested in the intersection of art and advocacy and using storytelling in my work. The collages I'll be sharing are about living with Emmy during the pandemic and my feelings about COVID protocols being lifted. When COVID hit in early 2020, Emmy scientists predicted that long COVID would become a mass disabling event. This was based on previous recorded infectious outbreaks. For those of us already housebound, it generated a lot of anxiety. There was not only the potential of COVID deteriorating our health further, but also killing us in other vulnerable populations. Another aspect of the anxiety experienced was feeling like those around us weren't taking the proper precautions to ensure our safety. Your bed is your entire world in chronic illness, and every day becomes shelter in place. Even if and when the pandemic ends, our lives will never return to normal. It was particularly hard for the chronically ill and disabled communities to see how the world was finding temporary lockdowns unbearable on their mental health and well-being. While public awareness surrounding the effects of isolation is of paramount importance, why is it only ever talked about when it happens to the able-bodied? The primary means of connecting and building community for the chronically ill and disabled is online because so much of the world is inaccessible. During lockdowns, we watched so many accommodations be put in place to keep everyone more connected. The world adapted and opened up to us too. Working remotely was commonplace. Church services and concert shows were being streamed. 
therapists could be accessed online, just to name a few. Many of these changes have been denied and claimed impossible when it was just us needing them. As mandates were lifted, we saw all this access taken away because it was never created for us in the first place. There's not enough public awareness around the very real possibility of post-viral diseases like ME developing after COVID. Viral disease experts estimate the number of people with ME to triple or quadruple due to the pandemic alone. Whether you're fully vaccinated or not, the notion of mild cases is a myth, as those are the cases at highest risk of sequelae. Research is revealing more and more that COVID is a vascular disease which has multi-system and multi-organ effects which can occur silently over time. This type of damage is not simple or easy to treat. There is no fix or cure for long COVID or possible ME. 16 years ago, I contracted a virus that sent my body plummeting deep into a post-viral disease inferno with no one or nothing stopping it. The land of post-viral disease, and more specifically ME, is sparse of scientific understanding and treatments, the likes of which you only discover when you find yourself there. When people minimize COVID with statements like, it's just a flu, I've had it and I'm totally fine now, or we need to learn to live with this virus, it negates how serious long-term disability and post-viral disease can be. These statements are not comforting because they're not true for everyone. COVID has killed 6.17 million people worldwide and left millions disabled in its wake. The pandemic is not over just because mask mandates are. Wearing PPE and rapid testing is how we learn to live with this virus, not by pretending it doesn't exist. Seeing friends and family embrace their freedom with the operating assumption that they will be fine feels very disappointing. Making decisions from the mindset that nothing bad could ever happen to you is health privilege at its finest. A healthy diet and lifestyle are not impenetrable shields against post-viral disease, which can strike anyone, even those in the prime of their youth when their vitality is strongest. When lockdowns ended, so did the temporary sentiments of, we're all in this together. The general public were only brief visitors to our housebound way of life a much less constrained version when compared to ours because they're not sick. Their newfound freedom did not include protecting the most vulnerable in their communities, who still must shelter because of the surging numbers of COVID. We're all in this together really meant, we're all in this together only when it affects us. These are just the experiences of one chronically ill disabled person throughout the pandemic. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. The Law of Equivalent Exchange by Rhiannon Blade The able-bodied collective, in an attempt to breathe, has shoved the disabled head under the water. So now, I must step back into my role as the observer. I will chronicle your fully lived lives at my expense until there is nothing left for me to hold on to and that timeline is growing exceedingly short. I will continue to sit untethered in a room that has become an intrinsic part of my body. The room breathes and sighs with me as my cats and I weave methodically through the house like a swarm in an ant hive, day in and day out. Only at night can I muster the courage to recall the memories of how my friends' and family's laughter had echoed around me before, or even frivolous late-night trips to the store with a trusted confidant, because I cannot bear carrying the pain of what could be for me, but will not, throughout the day. There is no amount of media in this world that I or others could consume that will relieve us of the burden of watching people indulge recklessly in their wants and wishes at the cost of ours. I would never ask another human being to wilt the way that I'm being forced to because I know the cost. I will only ever ask that people connect with their humanity and realize that freedom for all is obtainable within reason. You do not have to drown me to breathe. We can wade to the shore together. Take my hand, recognize me as a person, 
and realize that we both experience the human condition and through connection and empathy, we can become one collective that speaks and moves for all. Continue to wear your mask, no matter the laws. I am still in the water. My experience as a disabled and immunocompromised person in the pandemic has been overall extremely negative. I have not only dealt with fighting with so many people in my life, as well as people not actively in my life, ruining relationships, experiencing ableism from every single person I have ever met in my life, up to debating whether or not it's actually worth it to take precautions to make sure you don't accidentally kill me during the pandemic. So that'll do it. <laughs> that'll do it to you. As well as disabled people are more prone to having mental illness than the average person. And then we have been continually isolated more than any other group during the pandemic, so that has only exacerbated those things. So I think that is true for me and true for other people as well. And there's been so many movements during the pandemic that disabled people haven't been able to be a part of because of people not wearing masks, especially people wanting to fight for their own rights including people of color and people who have uteruses, especially with the draft of the Roe v. Wade being overturned, being leaked. People who are greatly affected by this, as well as people, I mean, I guess, for example, people of color and disabled people who typically would have higher risk pregnancies can't even go out and protest for their own rights because people refuse to wear masks. So it's like on every front during the pandemic, everywhere I turn, there are people in my eyes debating whether or not I'm a real person and that what they do affects me and that it's, you know, whether or not it's worth it to <laughs> make it so I can leave my house or other people as well. It's terrible. Thank you so much for watching the Nobody Left Behind video. We hope that you enjoyed the work of these 10 incredible artists. To learn more about the 10 artists you just met, visit thedisabilitycollective.com slash nobody left behind. If you enjoyed Nobody Left Behind, we would love for you to consider donating to the Disability Collective. As a not-for-profit organization, we rely solely on donations from our incredible community. If you wish to support the Disability Collective and all of the incredible artists that we work with, please visit thedisabilitycollective.com slash donate to get started. To learn more about the Disability Collective and our work, please visit our website, thedisabilitycollective.com. You can also find us on Instagram at Disability Collective and on Facebook at Disability Collective Canada. And lastly, we encourage you to take as many precautions against COVID-19 as possible to keep your fellow disabled, immunocompromised, and chronically ill friends, family, and community safe. Every artist in this video is vulnerable and at risk for contracting COVID-19, and we are all worth protecting. Thank you so much for tuning in and stay safe. <laughs>